uh, Representative Tom Berry, House District 45, and today I bring to you House Bill 140 for your consideration. Um, this bill basically expands the definition of synthetic marijuana, which is already an illegal drug or substance by Montana law. House Bill 140 includes a ban also on bath salts, which is a very dangerous drug which threatens our people, our citizens, our young people of Montana. In the last, and recently there have been two murders in Montana and both the killers were high using uh, synthetic drugs such as bath salts, salts or high, or spice while they're committing their crimes. In the 1960s when I was young, a lot of you guys are way too, that was before you were born, um, we heard of people <laughs> sniffing glue or um, yeah, sniffing gasoline fumes, uh, whatever to get high. But tell me, that is kids' play compared to these drugs today. Folks, these drugs are, drugs are dangerous. And uh, what we're going to be discussing here today, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, there are people out there who are working hard to always develop these drugs, and they don't care what it does to the minds or to the bodies of these people digesting them. Um, these are something very, very dangerous. Uh, their <clears throat> harmful effects are unpredictable. I saw an article on TV last night where they said that these guys come into, and it was right here, the emergency room in Helena, Montana, where they come into the emergency room so high that they have to sedate them, and they have to actually put IVs in them and sedate them for up to 10 days to get them down off these highs. They're so wild. So these drugs are, have a mm. tremendous effect on people. Um, <clears throat> these drugs are also uh, chemistry, make of chemistry, so they fall outside the state laws because they don't fall under the <clears throat> description of a um, harmful drug. So this is an issue we must address today for the safety of our streets and highways and the safety of our citizens. This is a Department of Justice bill, and there are several folks here who will offer testimony and will answer your questions, because I'm sure that I will not be able to. And uh, with this, I reserve the right to close. Uh, Chairman Dr. Kearns, um, on bill, page about 6 through uh, 31, you probably know way more about this bill than I do, since it has nothing but chemistry. So um, I'll just close with that. And uh, not close, but I'll leave with that. And with that, i got some people behind me that will want to talk about the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Barry. Uh, proponents, House Bill 140. Speak directly in the microphone, please, or bend it down there for you. There you go. My name is Anna Olivia Harris. I work at the Montana Forensic Science Division, where I am tasked with analyzing evidence for the presence of suspected dangerous drugs. From the year 1990, which is when I started, until 2009, all of the drugs, dangerous drugs that we encountered, were listed in the MCA. And we knew what these drugs were, and we knew how they affected people. Since, to, and let me point, there's only about 70 of them that we routinely saw in Montana. Since 2009, we have encountered over 40 new chemicals that are being distributed and used as a drug. And these are chemicals that have never been tested by legitimate pharmaceutical companies for their medicinal potential, for their efficacy, and for their safety. We find out about these drugs from visits to the emergency rooms, from calls to poison control centers, and from involvement with law enforcement. And I am going to talk about some of the changes that we are proposing to the existing bill for controlled substances. There are three main groups that I'll be talking about. The first are the spice compounds, which are the synthetic cannabinoids. And I'm going to pass out some examples, and these are kind of depending on the definitions, may or may not be controlled, and they're all sealed. And they better come back that way. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be passing around a magnifying. Right. I'll be passing around a magnifying glass also. So I'll start over here. This one. And to pay attention on these labels, they will say things like "not for human consumption," and the whole point of saying that is so that they can circumvent any kind of safety protocols that places like the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration puts into place to ensure product safety. A lot of these drugs are made overseas in giant laboratories, and their whole point is to avoid controlled substances acts like ours and to avoid regulation by the FDA. 
So they don't tell you in these little packets what's in there, but they do tell you what's not in there. They tell you that it doesn't contain any controlled substances currently regulated by the DEA. And one of them even, even says 100% DEA compliant. And I think that gives a very scary impression that since these are not listed as dangerous drugs, they are therefore safe. And what they do with the spice compounds is they take a plant material and they spray a chemical onto it. And then they sell that plant material. And it looks, I mean, it's a little vial full of green plant material. One could think that that is actually safe when it's actually had a synthetic plant material or a chemical sprayed on it. The changes that we'd like to propose to the synthetic cannabinoids is it starts on page 14. And the one, the first thing we did is kind of simplify some of the wording. In the last legislative session, we tried to control these. And at the time, we were only aware of about five major groups. As soon as that law went into effect, we saw a brand new slew of compounds coming out. And what these compounds are designed to do is bind to the same receptors in the brain as THC. So what we're introducing is language that says any compound that is known to have binding activity to these receptors is also going to be considered a Schedule I, unless it's approved for use by the FDA. So we have that caveat on there because it may turn out that there are compounds that have legitimate medical use. So far, there are none. The second type of product that we're going to be talking about are the bath salts. These are things that are based on the chemical structure of other Schedule I controlled substances, like cathinone, which is a stimulant, and then the Schedule II controlled substance, amphetamine, which is closely related to methamphetamine. Although they're based on compounds that are stimulants, when they do these chemical changes to the structure, they are much greater than stimulants. They also, in addition to being stimulants, act as hallucinogens or psychoactive compounds. And again, they are, I don't have any examples of these, but I do have a photocopy of some of them. They are, say things like not for human consumption. And they are sold as things like bath salts and plant fertilizers, but they have no legitimate purpose for those. And if you go online and research these, you see right away that they're actually made for human consumption, but they're boycotting or avoiding any regulations by the FDA. And we have controlled these um, on page 16 and 17 under MM and NN. We are controlling the backbone structure of the cathinone and the amphetamines. And again, unless they happen to have some kind of use approved by the FDA. The third group that we're going after are things that we've really just started seeing in the last three to six months. And these are what we call analogs. They're taking a known Schedule I drug, making a slight change to the chemical structure so that it's legal, and selling it as that Schedule I drug. And we see a lot of these in cute little tablets like these. These look a lot like candy. They're about the size of a sweet tart. They're brightly colored. They look very fun. And sometimes we get ones that contain up to four different compounds that are closely related to other Schedule I drugs, but they themselves are not scheduled. So we have added the definition on page six for dangerous drug analogs. And then we have listed analogs on page 18 under Schedule 1. I think the, all of these three additions and changes to the law will go a long way to help stop the marketing of these products to our citizens. We have most of the people that we found who are in possession of these drugs are under the age of 25. About half of those are under the age of 18. So these are readily available to our juveniles. And because they are purported to be legal, I think it gives a very dangerous impression that these are also safe. And nothing could be further from the truth. These compounds and chemicals are not safe. We've done a few other changes to the bill. We made some corrections to spelling errors that have been bothering us for years and years, some grammatical changes. 
we've tried to add some simpler language. We added like the abbreviation for lysergic acid diethylamide. We added LSD so that people can recognize that easier. We also added hashish. Courts have recently ruled that hashish is not considered a usable form of marijuana under the Mo Medical Marijuana Act. And we have been seeing a large increase in the number of hash samples, and they're very strong now. And hash has been listed in the definitions all along, and there's a sentencing enhancement for possession of more than one gram. Less than a gram is a misdemeanor. More than a gram is a felony. But we've never been able to, in our reports, make that easily understood. So having hashish listed will make that a little easier to follow. We've also updated the Controlled Substances Act to reflect what the current federal list is. So we've included the date rape drug, GHB, and a n number of other hallucinogens and some other chemicals or drugs that um, the federal government has added to this list. And that's a very quick and brief summary of what we're doing, what we're hoping to achieve with this. I appreciate you allowing me to speak to you today, and I appreciate the time that you're going to be given in considering this bill. And, of course, I'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, further proponents, House Bill 140. Morning, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mark Long, L-O-N-G. I'm the Narcotics Bureau Chief for the Department of Justice, Division of Criminal Investigation. I've been in law enforcement, drug enforcement in the state for close to 30 years, so I am here today from that perspective. <clears throat> we first started noticing these drugs that, the, that Ms. Harris just talked about probably two to three years ago. They started showing up in the state. Um, we did try to address it a little bit back in the other session and, and didn't get a lot of that accomplished, but, but in fact, Representative Barry tried that. We just didn't get that done. So there's a lot of confusion across the state um, with law enforcement as to which of these, you know, there's several hundred of these chemicals. And the confusion always is when you encounter someone who is high on some of these drugs, whether or not it's even an illegal drug or not. There's confusion on law enforcement's part. There's confusion on the part of the retailers that sell this. I mean, some of them legitimately don't know if it's a legal substance or not. And it's the same with the people that are using this. And, and Ms. Harris touched on that. A lot of people think it's legal and therefore it's, it's, it's okay to be used. And we see this stuff all across the state. I don't know if she mentioned it. She had a, a map that showed um, kind of where some of these uh, drugs are being found around the state. And I think her map alone just showed uh, over 100 um, incidents that the crime lab received um, of these drugs around the state. There are a lot of them here in Helena. We see them all across the state and a lot of it going into that Bakken because of the oil act activity up in the Bakken. I believe it was Wyoming stopped a car here not too long ago that was heading for the Bakken area, and the whole trunk of that car was full of these particular drugs, these bath salts and the synthetic marijuana. <clears throat> so there's basically the two types, and I think she covered that pretty well. Um, the problem we see in, in, in law enforcement uh, perspectives is that a lot of people take the synthetic marijuana thinking that it's marijuana, not to downplay marijuana, but they think that if they use this, it's going to have the same effect that marijuana does, and it certainly doesn't. Um, it, it, and it causes a lot of paranoia, violence, um, halluc hallucinations. And the same with the bath salts. Bath salts, these are not the ones that you would put in your, your bathtub. Um, <clears throat> these particular drugs have sort of a combination effect that manifests itself in, in users as something between or in a combination of uh, cocaine and methamphetamine as if those drugs by themselves are not bad enough. These sort of mimic the effects of both. Um, there have been several instances in the state. I mean, I could go on and on. I'm just going to mention a couple just in the interest of brevity. Um, there was a patrol officer stopped the car up in the Flathead area within the last couple of years. The person got out of that car with a rifle and put 30 rounds into the officer's patrol car before he was subdued. He was on bath salts. In fact, had a pound of bath salts in the trunk. There was a couple of instances here in, well, there was just recently one in Polson. There was a homicide in, Polson, in the Polson area, actually Sanders County, um, where that person admitted to being high on bath salts or a user of these bath salts. In Helena, there was a shooting, one I know of, where a police officer had to shoot a person who was trying to run him over in a, in a truck in one of the parking lots real close to here. Um, there was a hostage taken at a local convenience store, gas store here in Helena, um, that was a standoff situation that was finally resolved. That person was on bath salts. 
I could go on and on with those sorts of stories, but there's no legitimate use for this stuff. It's causing law enforcement issues all over the state. So this bill will go a long way in, in tightening up that language and making it much more user-friendly for law enforcement. And <clears throat> so I'm just going to, uh, obviously I'm a proponent. Just in closing, I want to also say that I'm also the executive director for the Montana Narcotics Officers Association, and that is a group of 150 to 200 officers across the state that work in the drug enforcement arena or have a focus on that. And I'm here on their behalf also in support of this bill. So I'll be around too if you have other questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Long. Further uh, proponents, House Bill 140. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Kurt Sager, S-A-G-E-R. Uh, I am a trooper with the Montana Highway Patrol. I'm also the state drug recognition expert coordinator and the coordinator for uh, Montana's impaired driving programs. Uh, I come here from a driving standpoint, obviously. Um, we all know in Montana we have uh, a very large problem with impaired driving fatalities and just impaired driving instances. Um, these drugs that this bill addresses play into that uh, greatly as well. When I became a certified drug recognition expert in 2006, <clears throat> kind of to echo off the words that, that uh, came before me, most of the drugs that we had out there we knew a lot about. Um, all of my training focused on those drugs, um, and just since 2009, the drug world has evolved extremely rapidly. Um, as a drug recognition expert, we deal with drugs in seven different drug categories. Prior to 2009, most of the drugs that we had fit into those categories very, very well. They did things that were consistent in almost every single person, and it was very easy for us to detect that. With some of these drugs, the synthetic uh, cannabinoids, the bath salts, uh, we're getting people that are acting like they're high on three, four, five different categories of drugs. We have people that seem to be on meth, but they're hallucinating. Um, people that appear to be high on marijuana, but they're hallucinating and acting like they're on methamphetamine. It creates very dangerous behavior regardless of whether they're behind the wheel or not. Uh, 2009, we had one confirmed driving case with Spice. Um, 2010, we had seven, and in 2011, we went up to nine. Those may not seem like significant numbers, but if we're dealing with just those synthetic cannabinoids, our crime lab cannot detect those. Um, so either the officer has to know exactly what he's looking at, or the subject has to tell them what they are on so that our crime lab can send it off uh, to one of our specialized labs across the country to detect that they're out there. If we're seeing those numbers just in the driving world, um, it's pretty easy to imagine how widespread the uses are. Uh, from the map that's going around, I looked at just some of these synthetic cannabinoid uh, cases that we've had. It spreads across the state from Sheridan County in the northeast corner, Lincoln County in the northwest <laughs> corner, Cascade County to Beaverhead County, they're everywhere. Uh, we're running into it everywhere and like uh, Mr. Long said a lot of times law enforcement officers don't know what to do with it because we don't have a mechanism that says we can we can charge this person with this this is a controlled substance a lot of the officers that are contacting <coughs> me say what do we do with this um, if they're impaired we can deal with them on the impairment side but as for possession of one pound of uh, bath salts <coughs> in the trunk of your car what do you do with that it's basically the equivalent of one pound of meth but it makes people do worse things, uh, hence the violent behavior. Some of the first cases of spice um, and the synthetic um, cathinones or the bath salts that we had happened right here in Helena. Um, but they were also <coughs> happening everywhere in the state basically at the same time. So it's a widespread problem that we have. Law enforcement doesn't really have a good tool to deal with these cases, um, and they are extremely dangerous. This is not um, the drugs that we had talked about, the marijuana, uh, this is these are bad bad drugs that create extremely violent behavior uh, one case that wasn't really brought up hit the news pretty hard here in the last year um, where the guy tried to eat another guy's face off uh, that was bath salts that's what it does it creates hallucinations um, that cause people to act in manners that is not human behavior at all um, obviously and we're seeing that in Montana it's not we're not <laughs> the isolated place here um, drugs are getting here just as easy as they are everywhere else so I'm a proponent for the bill. Thank you for your time. I'll be in the back for questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sager. Further proponents? Good morning. My name is Chad Parker. I am an assistant attorney general with the attorney general's office here in Helena. And I am a prosecutor, which is my primary responsibility at the office. And I started at the office in 2010 primarily dealing with prescription drug diversion 
It's where they move from the legal sphere, take prescription drugs from the legal sphere, move them into the illegal sphere. Well, as well as that work, I deal with the narcotics um, realm very, very often. Not just controlled substances, but uncontrolled substances come across our desk as well. I work very closely with Anne Olivia Harris and Mark Long and even Kurt Sager um, in trying to coalesce all that knowledge into how we give advice to different county attorneys throughout the state to deal with this, as well as prosecuting my own cases. In the past, we haven't had all the tools necessary to be able to prosecute cases that deal with synthetic cathinoids or cannabinoids. What we've done is we've presented language here, especially if you'll turn to page six, you'll see a new definitional section that we helped to draft under 7A, heading sub 7A, which is dangerous drug analog. And it states it means any material compound or mixture that is structurally related to or chemically derived from any dangerous <coughs> drug in schedules one through five. That's how we know <coughs> that they're controlled, is when they're in the schedules currently. And that's set forth in a certain title. And then we also have or, and this is a very important piece of this legislation that we're propounding right now, that is expressly or impliedly represented to produce or does produce a physiological effect similar to or greater than the effect of a dangerous drug in those schedules currently. What we're dealing with here, especially in prosecution, is a constantly moving target. One of the reasons that we propose new language to add to the list of synthetic cathinones and the language that we, we have in the chemical compounds is because these designers of these drugs, these designer drug creators, are very, very intelligent individuals. They know what they're doing, and they know how to avoid the enforcement of criminal law. So we're dealing with a constantly moving target, and this language is proposed to try and address that as best as we can at this time. The situation that we normally have in prosecutions, or one that we've commonly seen, is that one person who's already selling dangerous drugs, they'll say, hey, I've got these other drugs for you too. They're not really drugs. Even if they do a urinalysis on you, if your PO, your probation officer, tries to do an analysis on you, you're going to be fine because it's not controlled at this point in time. But it has the same kick as meth or the same kick as this variety of marijuana, which is a very strong strand of it or some kind of variety of it. That's what we're seeing. I was confronted with a circumstance not long ago where we had a distribution case and manufacture case, but we had to amend our complaint because of that very, very circumstance. We had to drop six or seven charges. Because once we got the back from the crime lab, we realized that, oh, wait a second, it's not one of the 15 or 20 that we had already tried to control in the past. It's a new one that we don't have. This language hopes to address that so that we're not always dealing with a moving target in the future or having the problems with the moving target hit us in the face. What I'm presenting to you is, is trying to show you also that they do a portion of this work, but it also kind of comes down to the bottom of funnel where I sit. And where I sit at the bottom of that funnel, sometimes we have the tools, the best tools that we could possibly get, but they don't quite work for the nut or the bolt that we've got to, we've got to tighten out. And that's what we're trying to do here. And we really hope that you will consider this, this language and realize the, the gravity of the effect, not from the beginning, but also to the end. Thank you for your time, and thank you for cons your consideration. I'll be available for questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Further proponents? Good morning, members of the committee, Chairman Kearns. For the record, my name is Vicki Turner, and I am the director of the Prevention Resource Center, and we're housed in the Department of Public Health and Human Services. I'm here today to support House Bill 140. The bill removes over-the-counter products marketed as bath salts out of the market. These products are currently sold across the state and over the Internet and are marketed to appeal to young people when, in fact, they are not used in a bath but rather snorted, ingested, and injected. The chemical makeup commonly found in these drugs is potentially more dangerous than cocaine and are extremely addictive. The health consequences and side effects include hallucinations, which you've heard, agitation, paranoid psychosis, diminished cognitive ability, and an increase in heart rate. Also, expanding the dangerous drug analog to include substances that cause a physiological effect similar to or greater than the effect of dangerous drugs in Schedules 1 through 5 to cover these products is good public health and good prevention. I urge do pass. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Further proponents? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Mark Murphy. I represent the County Attorneys Association, the Chiefs of Police, uh, the MPPA, and because Mr. Smith is upstairs in Senate Judiciary, the Chiefs Association as well. 
Um, and I think all of the issues have been very well covered at this point. Uh, we support this legislation. Uh, and I would like to enter this testimony in the Chairman's Brevity Award, but I would ask for your support for this legislation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murphy. Um, further proponents? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, I am Stuart Doggett. Uh, first name is S-T-U-A-R-T -T and then D-O-G-G-E-T-T. -T. I represent the Montana Pharmacy Association. Uh, we support this bill. Um, we actually had our annual meeting uh, this, this last weekend, and my technical experts looked at it, and they appreciate it and think it really meets uh, uh, their concerns, which they have, and the problems that they're seeing in, in their local communities and, and hearing about as well. They appreciate the inclusion of the analogs on page 18. They also like the bath salts issue and think it's appropriately addressed in this bill. We talked about having that approaching actually the Board of Pharmacy in the last few months about doing this by rule, but we were pleased to see this bill and, and like the inclusion of that in it. So with those provisions, we stand in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. Further proponents? Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, Riley Johnson with the National Federation of Independent Business. Why am I here? Uh, you've all heard the testimony of the dangerous drugs and the laboratories and the uh, driving problems and so forth. Let me give you a little story. Uh, and like most of you, except perhaps the chairman, uh, you're like me. What the heck is spice? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what spice is. Two years ago, Representative Barry got a phone call. And it was a person who had a coal mine. And two people came to work one morning obviously high or something. He sent him off for a drug test and he came back negative. So he calls Representative Barry and says, we got to do something about this for the employer. We can't, you know, we have, we need some kind of thing that you can't get through a drug test or, or something. So he jumped on it, Representative Barry did. Uh, in talking to him one day, he says, I have this bill, it's going to eliminate synthetic marijuana or he's going to eliminate spice. I said, what spice? I had to be educated. I remember going through to a number of groups while that bill was floating around, and I would ask everybody here, what is spice? And anybody over 25 or 30 wouldn't raise their hand. Under 25, most of them did. So that's the, the, the real problem. We representative at that time, this is what the, uh, the, the can opener that opened the can of worms was his bill in uh, t uh, 2011. Uh, and it brought it to the fore, and you've heard here that it, it's the uh, situation has only come to the service in the last two or three years. Um, it, is, it is totally out of hand, and as <coughs> a, an employer, and for the employers of Montana and NFIB, I would urge you a support of uh, House Bill 140 because in the workplace, this thing can be and is, particularly when you're dealing with heavy equipment uh, employees and people like that, this thing is dangerous and we can't detect it. So give us some help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Further proponents? Further proponents? Seeing none. Opponents? House Bill 140. Opponents? Seeing none. Informational witnesses? Seeing none, questions from the committee. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Parker, uh, in your address, you, you said that the language in this bill uh, you hope is to address current and ongoing drug proliferation. Um, can you... Uh, can you expound on that a little bit? What are your hopes, or is there some finality in this bill? I can, and thank you, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and the rest of the committee. What we're, why we propose this in the way we propose it is because it's an amalgamation of already tested law. You may recognize some of this language from the Imitation Dangerous Drugs Law that is codified in Title 45, Chapter 9, starting somewhere about 111 through 116, I believe, if I'm, if I'm recalling without the book in front of me. That's normally been presented as a way to prosecute drugs that are manufactured for the purpose of saying these are a prescription drug or they are a dangerous drug that we already control.
but the person, the end user, isn't getting what they want. So we can't use them in this circumstance, though the language was very similar. What we have here is something that nobody wants except for people in the illicit sphere. And so it attempts to try and tie it to the already existing schedules that are there, things that we know are already dangerous and controlled in a certain fashion. Our belief is that this is balanced language that has been tested here before and, and proposed in other states as well. Though we may be on some of the leading edge of this with this language, we believe that this will allow us, at least in the courts, if we come up with something new or something new comes before us, to at least argue for that court and then get case law that will allow us to prosecute under manufacturing and distribution uh, charges as they stand currently, as well as moving them properly into the Schedule 1 arena. And for those of you who don't, may not understand what the Schedule 1 arena is, sentencing is very much contingent upon which schedule these drugs fall into. Drugs that have no legitimate use, such as cocaine um, or other, other serious drugs, pure heroin, those kind of drugs are all on Schedule 1 because they don't help you with anything to help you become healthier, but they have a high addictive potential. So what we've done is we've moved these who have no legitimate medical usage, moving them into Schedule 1 as well, and so we're hoping that if something does pop up in the future, the courts will help us address it before having to come back again and again and again and just add to a laundry list of new chemical compounds. So that's how we hope to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Representative O'Neill. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have a question for Anna Libby Harris. Ms. Harris. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Chairman and Ms. Harris. I knew a girl once that when she was in grade school, they diluted strychnine and injected it, is, which, and they got a high from it, evidently. Would that be on this list of drugs, or would that be prohibited in Montana? Strychnine is considered a poison, and it's controlled or listed somewhere else in the codes. I think there are places in the codes that I'm not familiar with that address poisons, but it's not actually listed in the Controlled Substances Act that I'm aware of, and its chemical structure is such that it does not fall into any of the new proposals that we're making. So I would, I would say that no. So follow up? Follow up. So is there a chance that but by putting this uh, analog drugs in here that we're, that we're taking people and taking them and and channel them towards strychnine and other poisons in order to get their high? You want to refer that? If yes, I'll refer that to Chad, because <laughs> I don't think I can answer that. <laughs> Mr. Park? In answer to your question, we already have a law that deals with consuming or manufacturing or using toxic substances, things that may be used as poisons or other things that are harmful to the body themselves, either whether you're in possession or otherwise. We would typically prosecute under those if there's a need for prosecution in that circumstance, so distributing. However, and, and I hope I'm understanding your question clearly enough, we're not trying to move people who would be in legal use of certain things that may not be controlled into illegal use automatically. We believe that the laws that we already have, in effect, cover that. And prosecutorial discretion also weighs into that heavily as well. We try and make certain that there's a balanced approach to any kind of prosecution or control of any of these substances that may come up on the horizon. What we know now is that we have a new realm of dangerous drugs that, are, or that we're at the beginning of, that we know are going to get worse. In your circumstance, as sad as that circumstance is, I believe we already have that covered under other ways to address it, other laws that exist currently. Follow up? Follow up. Well, wouldn't these drugs here, wouldn't they be toxic substances too? Couldn't we just prosecute them under the laws we already have? That's a very good question. And the reason that we're trying to move this, this, this won't affect the laws that we, the laws we have already for toxic substances does not normally come up in the same context that we're dealing with right here. We're dealing with hard, dangerous drugs here, and in a way without this law that we can't deal with right now. While we could possibly deal with it under this law or another law that already exists, we would still be left without this law with a large open arena where we cannot prosecute the dangerous effects that are happening with these other dangerous drugs. And that is one of the primary reasons why we're proposing this legislation. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Gersky. Chair, a question for Mr. Doggett. Mr. Doggett. Um, Chair, Mr. Doggett, I just have a quick question, and, and I'm hoping that you are the correct person, but um, are any of these new chemical compounds that want to be listed, can any of them reflect prescriptive uses? And I guess what I'm questioning in, um, is Mr. Johnson's concern about liability <laughs> insurance for employers. Um, and I, I understand that there's probably some other areas in the code that that's prosecutable. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering about the chemical components and if you can answer that from a pharmaceutical standpoint. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, I am not a pharmacist, so I'm not an expert. I think I would, I'd, I'd be more comfortable deferring that question. And, and I'd also like to follow up with one of our members who's going to be here later today and, uh, and track you down to provide an answer to that. I would say generally uh, our members, we do have a certain segment of our membership that does compound <coughs> and they're seeing a variety. And actually one of our compounders looked at this legislation and just felt it was necessary because to make that differentiation between those legal prescriptions and what is illegal. So uh, let me provide more information, but if there's someone else here in the audience I could defer to, to I think it'd be, you'd have a better answer. Thank you, Mr. Doggett. Uh, anyone else want to take a stab at that? Um, no? You, are you okay? All right. Uh, Representative Lynch. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sager, please. Mr. Sager, um, can you kind of walk us through the kind of the chemical reaction, what somebody would look like when they come into the emergency room, um, and if they are have, having to be chemically restrained as a dude for 10 days, and the long-term ramifications and effects on somebody's brain? Is there flashbacks or any uh, sort of long-term brain damage that uh, can or may not or may or may not be repaired? Uh, Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, <clears throat> each one of these substances is a little bit different from the other. Um, due to the manufacture process, uh, the way it's distributed, who is making it, uh, the results aren't always the same. Um, if we're most of the emergency room uh, substance issues that we're dealing with are dealing with the bath salts. Um, Generally what ends up happening, it causes an extreme elevation in uh, heart rate and blood pressure, um, and along with that comes an extreme elevation in body temperature. Uh, anytime an adult gets a uh, very high body temperature for an extended period of time, it's very harmful to the brain. Um, the way that drugs interact with the human body is they attach themselves or they react with the brain. That controls the nervous system in the body, that's how the heart rate, blood pressure, all that comes up. Um, so anytime you have a substance that's introduced into the body, it goes to the brain, uh, there are potential long-term effects. Now, as to flashbacks and all of that, I'm unaware of any at this point, but a lot of these drugs have only been around for a couple years. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us know some of the history behind LSD. Um, they show extreme flashbacks with that. Uh, some of these drugs, it's very potential, um, but we don't have any, any hardcore numbers as to whether those are occurring right now. Uh, a lot of the emergency room visits that people are coming in on, it is because uh, they're 20 years old and they feel like they're having a heart attack. Well, they'll come in and they'll have a heart rate of 140 beats per minute. In a 20-year-old, that is not anywhere close to normal. Uh, most 20-year-olds should have a heart rate around 60 uh, to 70 beats per minute, not 140. And they're coming in with blood pressures that are 150 over 100 or even higher, which is extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, and then the body temperatures that are going up into 104, 100 five degree range because of these substances. Uh, anytime you're into that, the potential for long-term effects is, is very great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Hill. Oh, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Chair. I, I think my question is uh, also for Mr. Parker. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Parker, um, just quickly, uh, uh, I think a sample of one got passed around the room. Representative Eck, can you hold up the Bob Marley packet? <laughs> All right. So, Mr. Chair, Mr. Parker, um, so I was a prosecuting attorney 10 years ago. I've never heard of this <laughs> bath salts and, and uh, or seen those before. Um, and so my question falls, I guess, thinking like a prosecuting attorney. My understanding with the legislation today is that you're putting the definition of these chemical compounds into Schedule One dangerous drugs, which is similar to heroin, cody, cocaine, LSD. Um, so I guess my question is, is if a young person, and believe me, 
I completely support the Department of Justice in this bill. I think you had me with eating someone's face off. <laughs> um, but uh, but I guess my question again co goes to um, sort of the prosecutor in me is what amounts are we talking in here? I didn't see any penalty provisions at all. And so, for example, if a, a 17, 18 year old kid has a Bob Marley, um, is this is this amount of that pack? Is that a, a Schedule One felony, or what are we talking about here? They would on yes, Representative Hill, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. This would immediately be moved into, regardless of amount, these analogs into the felony range. Yeah. Primarily because of the fact that we don't know, and and we see different results from each amount of consumption. We see the same kind of dramatic effects with one person for one small amount as we might with a whole lot of it in another. But what we primarily understand is this stuff is either soluted, put into some kind of chemical or, or, or fluid base and injected or snorted or smoked. Mm -hmm. um, spice very often is being used or ingested in the same manner as marijuana would be. And we understand from the prosecution world that's normally a gram or two at a time per joint. Or if they're using what's called a blunt, mm -hmm. which would be a very large one wrapped in tobacco leaf or whatever else like that, it could be much, much higher. Um, so we don't know exactly how much they're using from time to time. We know what we've seen, however, is large quantities of these packets themselves being being found on individuals who've been found in possession or stacks and pounds of this of the material being found in these, well, at sometimes medical marijuana outlets uh, where they're saying, we'll give you this, but we can give you this too. It's stronger than Romulan diesel or it's stronger than Bubba Kush or other strains of marijuana that are very potent. <clears throat> and it'll make you feel crazy high like meth does. Would you like that as a little treat to take along? We see that circumstance very, very often. And that's why I believe it's so dangerous. Um, one, we don't need any more horribly reactive, dangerous drugs on the market. Mm -hmm. And we don't need them being proliferated throughout our youth and throughout people who um, or proliferated by people who are apparently trying to alleviate the concerns and pain of others. Mm. And so that's the context we're primarily seeing it in, as well as the context of you're on probation, you can't have any of these things, but because the prosecutor didn't have clairvoyance about this coming into existence two years, three years ago, whenever you were put on probation, he can't get you or she can't get you in trouble for that now. We're primarily not seeing it in the, in the powdered form or in the, the shake form in a possession case, mainly in the distribution and manufacturing <coughs> case. Mr. Chair, can I ask a quick follow-up? Follow up. Again, Sorry. I support you. I just uh, are there other states though that have um, nuanced, I guess, the amount of this? It seems to me that a felony for having one of those Bob Marley packets. Certainly, there will be an educa education component very quickly. <laughs> with I, this I have not seen it yet. Okay. I have not seen it yet, and that's why we tried to form this law as it is. Um, what we would try to do is with Schedule 1 drugs, I believe the amounts are already taken into account most of the time. Okay. If you're either in a possession of a Schedule 1 drug in any amount at this point in time, whether it, unless it's marijuana or right. something else that's delineated, <laughs> where you have certain gram amounts or certain ounce amounts that are allowed, where it shifts over, any other Schedule 1 drug, they don't specify to amount under our current laws. So therefore, we'd be doing the same exact thing with this compound by adding it in as Montana already does with other Schedule Ones. We didn't want to change that structure to make it more complicated, which addresses, I think, the concern, which is a, a very valid concern, yep. whether we want to felonize certain behavior. Yep. Representative Lynch. Uh, also for Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker, please. And I, I guess uh, I, I want to uh, say I appreciate the far-sighted nature of the attempt to to uh, control this. I, I work in, a, in the correctional world, um, and it's an issue that's been around there for a couple years. Um, some of what you're talking about, you know, you have uh, a guy on, on probation or parole. Um, and so the, um, I, I appreciate that. And the, the kind of the question I had was, is um, part of the training, one of the trainings I received, there was a crocodile, and it started with a K, and it actually came out of Russia. And they had showed some pictures um, of people's literally their skin just falling off and holes in their legs. Do you have any, not to be uh, gory, but do you have any pictures if somebody on the committee wanted to look and kind of see what the physical reaction or, or what, uh, what we're dealing with here? I do not have them with me. However, I can speak to Krakadil, which is what crocodile is in Russian, and that's what it comes from. I, I lived there for a time. And knowing what kind of things they've been concocting in prisons over there for years and years and years, I can tell you what the results are with most people, which is, is horrific. 
I served there as a missionary in the early 90s and saw dangerous drugs moving into the regular sphere again and again and again, and not at the time with crocodile, but with other things called Zelen and other things like that that were horribly harmful to people. They didn't know what they were getting. They were coming from China. They were coming from prisons. They were coming from everywhere else, and they would automatically have respiratory disease, and they'd have other kinds of problems, or they would die. These are 25-year-old <laughs> kids dying from ingesting these things. Now, while I haven't seen that here in the United States yet, I don't have the presentation with me, I'm certain we could find it and present it if required. Thank you. Uh, Representative Eck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Parker, so when Trooper Sager pulls someone over and finds 600 pounds of bath salts in the trunk of the car and contacts you, are you unable to, is there any way, have you been prosecuting these crimes in any way or you're just not able to do anything? Currently we are absolutely unable to do anything with it at all unless they act out in some other violent manner or they have it in conjunction with other dangerous drugs. We have to go, thank you for having contact with law enforcement, have a nice day. That's really where we're at right now. And that's why we tried to take this far-sighted approach with this, because I was seeing so many of these cases either coming from referrals from the, the county attorney's offices saying, Chad, I don't know what to do. What do we do here? It's like, well, let me think on it. And after sifting through the code that we currently have meant to address toxic substances or imitation dangerous drugs or the regular dangerous drug statutes, which is the toolbox we have, I was left without a legitimate ethical approach to deal with this problem. And so as we drafted this, we tried to take that into account. And so we believe that by adopting this into a da the dangerous drug definitions and treating them the same way as we do other Schedule I dangerous drugs, we might be able to have an effect on it and hopefully protect our youth and other citizens. Representative Lynch. Uh, real quick question. Are you able to confiscate that? At this point in time? Yes. What the, the circumstance that's happening right now since some of this is controlled, there's a series of them which Ms. Harris can, did speak to and can speak to probably again. There's some within what's, what I refer to as the JWH range. JWH and then 018 is one of them and they've got numbers after that as well. Because some of these may be a controlled substance at this point in time, they are clearly allowed to, to seize that if they have probable cause to seize other things that are on that, in that premises, whether by a search warrant or, or other, other means that we use under law. However, what happens is you have a two or three month delay after you've charged then believing that this is a substance that is controlled or may very well be a controlled substance such, what, such as being in the JWH range and then it turns out to be something else called AM2201 or some other chemical compound and that's why you have to then amend your, amend your uh, information or charging documents and go before a judge that may not like you being there in the first place about these things and who then can then challenge your credibility as a prosecutor for you didn't have your ducks in a row when you started this out. That's normally how it's seized at that point in time and that's normally how it's dealt with, with delays. This is made not only so that we can prosecute this and address the harms, but also so that prosecutors throughout the state maintain a level of credibility when they're charging. And so that we can take the final step in helping to enforce and eradicate these problems by carrying the ball across the line as prosecutors often have to do. Representative O'Neill. A uh, question for this, what, uh, Mr. Murphy here. Mr. Parker. Mr. Parker, sorry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Parker, on page 15 of the bill it says any compound that has been demonstrated to have agonist binding activity as a cannabinoid receptors, but anything such a, as coffee or alcohol or smelling salts or no-dos or powered drinks have agonist binding activity at one of these receptors? I believe no. The proper per the person to direct that to would be Ms. Harris, however. Okay, thank you. We've tried to tailor this, I guess, in general sense to, to answer your question, Representative O'Neill, to make this so we're not just adding new laws where new laws could possibly be added. We're trying to work within the framework that we already have and trying to cover an area that's not covered currently because of the greatness of the harm. If we could work with the toolbox we had currently, we'd continue to do so. I have a question for you, Mr. Parker, since I don't see any others at the moment while you're there at the, uh, the rostrum. Um, you had a hand in drafting this bill? Yes, Mr. Okay. Chair. Um, it's possible for me right now to drive uh, into uh, Helena here somewhere and purchase one of these products off the counter somewhere? Right now, yes. Right now, yes. Okay. 
And so by making them illegal or moving them into this category, passing this bill, you think we will um, hamper that um, availability, seeing how our current war on drugs would not really be a resounding success. You're exactly right. What do we do, Mr. Chairman? How do we approach this? How do we actually resolve this? And those of us who deal with the dangerous drug context are constantly frustrated by that. As much effort as we put in, very often we're thwarted by people's creativity or desire. I personally believe that the final chapter of this will be is if people's hearts and minds change. We know that hasn't worked. However, there are people that we can help. There are people that we can save in the interim. And keeping the availability of this reduced is the first step to doing that. I think that if we save or protect one person, we've done our job. And that's why I've helped to draft this in this way. Yes, the war, if you will, on drugs um, seems to be a war without end, doesn't it? Um, one that they may have started without an exit plan, and that's frustrating to everyone. <laughs> However, I think that there are particular battles that are fought daily where someone's future can be put on a different path. And that may be altruistic, and you may not hear that out of many prosecutors, but I really truly believe that that is something that we can be doing. That that's the real war we should be fighting. And hopefully in time, it won't be there. People won't be tempted by it. People won't care about it. Um, and they'll move on to something else that we can already deal with in some other way. Okay. Final question. This is kind of a longer question. Okay. Even the chairman does longer questions occasionally. <laughs> Every session, we're handed the code commissioner bill, which uh, changes, you know, grammatical errors in our code. And it's usually about a 300-pager. It's one of the most uh, nerve-wracking bills for me to vote on because I'm never totally sure there isn't something in there uh, that I missed, you know, an and versus an or and some different things like that that could change the bill. So now you're asking me to give my nod of approval and the power that we have to create legislation, 32 pages of organic chemistry here, and you're going to assure me there's nothing in here that I don't know about um, um, that will change something by uh, accident or purpose, so I will have to come visit with you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I hope that we don't have that kind of an experience together. However, I know that the portion that I worked on, I really worked hard to make certain that it was grammatically correct. I tried to make certain that the, the language choice that we chose has, one, been tested, but also has the correct linguistic meaning. Now, with regards to chemical compounds, you and Ms. Harris would know much more about that than I do. I saw it, and I was, I've, I've had experience with this in the past, and it still is somewhat Greek to me. However, I have to work in conjunction with the crime lab anyway every time, and they have assured me that those chemical compounds as listed are meant to cover this. The language that I presented was meant to cover those stop gaps, those gaps that may, may come up in the language. Okay. So that even if we have that error, hopefully the language that I've created in common English <laughs> will take care of that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parker. Would the uh, sponsor like to close? Yes, I think it's about time. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, you have just heard testimony from a chemical ex expert from our state crime lab, law enforcement, criminal investigators, prosecutors, and others. This is a real problem in Montana. This is a real dangerous problem in Montana. I ask you today to shut these drug criminals down the best we can who are preying on our citizens, who are preying on our children. I'm asking you today for due pass on House Bill 140. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative Barry. This concludes the hearing on House Bill 140. Committee, that is all our work uh, for today. We will have five bills up tomorrow, so you'll want to come, uh, come prepared. And uh, I have one. we're adjourned. Mike Manahan, bill.